Good morning and welcome to Church Family. My name is Barry, I'm the vicar here in Upton, the surrounding parishes. It's great to be with you today. I do hope you'll enjoy worshipping with us. Let me tell you a little bit about what's coming up in our service. Uh, John Boardman is going to be bringing us our Bible reading. We've got a special testimony video later on from a chap who recently became a Christian after being a Muslim. And then we're going to be looking today at two of Jesus' miraculous healings in Mark chapter 5. And as well as all that, we've got our usual mix of fun worship songs, which I hope will help you focus your heart on the Lord. Anyway, I hope you're all well, and I'm looking forward to this weekend an awful lot, because I've got my first wedding to do in ages. I do love a wedding. This is my first, I think, since December. So do be praying for Matt and Rhiannon as they get ready for their big day on Monday. And then also for James and Nicole. I've got another wedding next Saturday as well. So it's going to be a busy old week. But apart from the wedding, next weekend we've got Breakfast Church coming up. That's on July the 3rd at half past nine. And then for every other weekend, we're going to be running an online service like this one. Uh, Breakfast Church is taking a break on July the 17th. It'll be back on the first Sunday in August. And we'll be providing online worship for you throughout that time. But finally, if you'd like to support our work, do visit our giving page, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash giving. Or you can pause the video right now and scan this QR code. That's something new for this week. And you'll find everything you need to know there to give a gift to help fund the gospel work we're doing both online and in person. Great, we're going to turn our hearts to worship now. And let's begin with some words from Exodus 15. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great, how great. you 
great is our God, King Jesus, our great God. Thank you for all you've done for us, for rescuing and cleansing and healing us. Help us to hear you now as we listen to your word being read. Amen. So before I bring you the sermon, here's John with our Bible reading. Our reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, beginning at verse 21. When Jesus has again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him whilst he was by the lake. When one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and went to saw Jesus, he fell to his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hand on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed, pressing around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once Jesus realised that Pa had come out of him, he turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. When Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Overhearing what this said, Jesus told them, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and his disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Koum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was twelve years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John, thank you for reading that for us. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for those amazing miracles that Jesus did. Give us confidence to trust him now by your spirit. Minister to us as we reflect upon this wonderful passage. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Tracy was a nurse in a New York hospital when COVID hit. She was right there on the front line leading a 40-bed COVID respiratory unit in the early days of the crisis. And she saw many of her patients die. Uh, but as time wore on, wonderfully, she saw more and more of them recover. As you can imagine, the experience affected her faith profoundly, though perhaps not in the way you'd expect. For her, 
The defining moment was when a middle-aged Cantonese man who didn't speak a word of English finally recovered from the illness. On the day he was discharged, the staff gathered, as had become their custom, to applaud the patient as he was wheeled out in a wheelchair. And as he reached the door, the chap threw his hands in the air and shouted in English, Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! You see, our dear Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, isn't just Lord of the good times. He's Lord of the tough times as well. In fact, when life is at its gloomiest, that's when Jesus shines the brightest. Think back to our Gospel reading. I bet you'd be hard pushed to imagine two people in tougher situations than the main characters in it. First of all, there was Jairus, the father of a dying daughter. Now, I've got seven kids. My kids have been amazingly blessed with good health all the way through their lives. We're so grateful to God for that. I think we've had a grand total of two nights in hospital with the seven of them, which is pretty amazing going when you think of the scrapes kids get into. I thank God then that we've been so blessed. For Jairus, it was so different. His little girl was a death door and he is absolutely desperate to find help, as I'm sure any father would be. And that's why he goes to Jesus. He's on his hands but knees begging before Jesus, please Lord, please my little girl is dying, come and lay your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. Now it takes a lot to make a man beg like that. And Jairus particularly is an unusual candidate for this begging role because he was one of the synagogue rulers, a, a significant establishment leadership figure, one who would find it very hard to come to Jesus because Jesus is a challenge to everything the synagogue stands for. Usually when a religious leader came to Jesus they'd come in secret. Think of Nicodemus in the Gospel of John coming to Jesus at night when nobody could see him. But Jairus is so desperate, he comes in a crowd in daylight, begging Jesus, come and save my daughter. Well, you would if you loved your daughter, wouldn't you? Then there's our second character, the extremely sick lady. We don't know her name and we don't know precisely what is the condition that she has. All we know is she has been suffering from bleeding for 12 years, which in the culture of the day meant she was ritually unclean. And anything and anyone she touched became unclean too. You remember that Scotland player who spent time with two of the England players after the big game last week? And they had to go and self-isolate for 10 days when it turned out that the Scotland player had COVID. 10 days sounds pretty tough going, doesn't it? But this woman, she has been self-isolating not for 10 days, but for 12 whole years. 12 years cut off from people cut off from hugs, cut off from visiting family and friends. And that's only the half of it. She's also cut off from temple, cut off from making sacrifice and atonement for her sin, and therefore cut off from God. Her situation is desperate. She's spent everything she has on doctors and it hasn't helped her at all. No one can help her. But Jesus did. And he did it, not because he's a doctor or knows some funny potions, but because he is Lord over disease and death. He's bigger than them. He's stronger than them. And if we cling to him, we can face disease and death with confidence. That doesn't mean we won't get sick or that we don't need doctors. It just means we know the chap who's in charge and he's the one we need to cling to in the storm. And that's what the woman does here. She reaches out to Jesus in a very simple naive way. There's no theology degree required. She hasn't undertaken a, a course. She's not got any great philosophical insight into what she's doing. Verse 28, she just reaches out her hand to Jesus, hoping for something better. And she gets so much more than she bargained for. Jesus says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I think it's lovely that he recognises this in public. There's no secrecy about this healing. It's done very publicly so that everybody knew this woman had been healed. Everybody knew she could be restored to community. Let me ask you, in the tough times, what do you do? Who do you reach out to? Do you reach out to Jesus or do you pull back? Because I find a lot of churchy folk, when the going gets tough, actually pull back on their faith. It's like they only believe in God in the good times, but when the going gets tough, they bail out. 
And that's tragic because often the times Jesus draws closest to us are actually the right in the middle of the bad times. Do you remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd? How does that line about the valley of the shadow of death go? Take me on a diversion around the valley of the shadow of death or I'll give up on you? No, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. So the God of the Bible doesn't steer us around suffering. He walks us through it and walks with us through it. He's right there beside us. Marcos Zapata leads a church in Spain and at the height of the Spanish Covid outbreak he was taken ill and he spent 21 days in hospital and in the early stages he thought he was going to die. As he lay on his bed struggling to breathe he found himself begging, bargaining, pleading with God for a miraculous recovery just as he would when praying for healing for one of his congregation but no miraculous healing came. And eventually he had to come to terms with the idea that a miraculous cure wasn't coming. And strangely, that was when he began to respond to the treatment he was receiving from the doctors and made a full recovery. And along the way, he began to reflect deeply about his faith and the meaning of suffering. And as he did so, he found himself experiencing God's presence and care with him in a whole new way. The Lord walked with him through the valley of the shadow of death. Marcos said afterwards, I do not believe illness is a punishment sent by God, but as I waited in faith for his healing directly or through medical means, I could better understand that others were suffering as well. I could sympathise with them and I realised that God continued to be Lord no matter what was going to happen to me. Isn't that a wonderful statement of faith? God continues to be Lord no matter what happens to me. He's the rock we can depend upon. Jesus is the only one who can transform life in the face of any disaster. And whether he transforms it through some miraculous healing or simply through changing our hearts or giving the courage to us to accept our situation, that is when he shines the brightest. But we do have to trust him. Jairus placed his trust in Jesus as the one to save his daughter. The woman placed her trust in Jesus as the one to heal her illness. How are you placing your trust and faith in Jesus to help you at the moment? Are you trusting him about your problems? You see, the temptation for us as relatively comfortable Westerners is that when trouble comes, rather than cling to Jesus, We'll cling to other things instead, to money or power or status or popularity. I think that's why a lot of people have found COVID so hard, because it's deprived us of many of those things. But I want to say Jesus is bigger and more powerful than any of those things. We know the chap who's in charge. He's bigger and more powerful and more astonishing than anything this world can throw at us. And whenever we involve him, He brings transformation. When I was a a teenager, I'd occasionally play basketball at a a local leisure centre. And I remember one Wednesday afternoon, as my friends and I walked there, um, we we were walking along a dual carriageway, we we noticed the council had been out and had spruced up the whole road with hundreds and hundreds of pots of flowers. Every street sign had a basket hanging from it. Same with the streetlights. And all along the railings along the road, these ugly blue railings were decked out in colourful flowers. And we thought nothing of it particularly until we came out of our basketball game and noticed that they'd all gone. And uh, later that evening I I heard on the news that the Queen had been in town and she'd travelled down that road. And ever since I've kind of imagined the Queen living in this constant world of of council-funded blooming flowers that stretch half a mile ahead of her car and end about a mile behind her. And in her presence everything is blooming. And it's just the same with Jesus. When we bring him into the situation, everything blooms. Everything is transformed. If we'll trust him. If we'll bring him in. But will we? But do we? You see, I can stand here all day telling you how amazing Jesus is and how transformative encountering and inviting him into your life is. 
But that's just information for you, isn't it? If that information is actually going to lead to transformation in your life, or in my life, we have to act on it. We have to trust him. And I don't just mean trust him when no one is watching, but trust him in public too. That's why I love that story of the Cantonese man shouting out, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. He wanted everybody on that ward to know. I wonder if we would have done. I wonder if I would have done. I mean, what's it like being an overt Christian today in the workplace? Oh, be careful what you say. Keep your head down. Don't rock the boat. Or with your friends. Don't want to make things awkward by talking about religion. Stick to soap and football instead. In school, oh, I don't want to stand out from the crowd. Let's just talk about TikTok and Fortnite, shall we? Jesus said, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? That's what it means to trust Jesus. And that's what Jesus asked Jairus to do. When the news comes that Jairus' daughter has died, what does he say to him? Don't be afraid, just believe. Now, if you were Jairus and you'd just received news that your daughter was dead and you'd seen her being sick for ages, would you have trusted Jesus at that point? Can you begin to imagine how much trust it would have required for Jairus to keep going through all of that? Let's think about the reasons Jairus has not to trust Jesus about his daughter getting well. Well, he knew the girl was dying. Then there's the message from the family announcing her death. Then there's the confirmation of the message when he sees all of the mourners mourning at the house. Then there's everybody laughing at Jesus and at Jairus for trusting him. Mockery is a troubling thing, isn't it? And then as he walks into her bedroom with Jesus and he sees the lifeless corpse lying on the bed, everything in his head and in his family and even his own eyes tells him that Jesus cannot be trusted. Just like everything in our heads and in our families and our eyes will tell us today that Jesus' promises cannot be trusted. And then Jesus raises the girl from the dead. He waits until all hope is gone. All the alternatives have been exposed as useless. And that's when he acts. You see, he's the one in charge. And we really can trust him. He's earned it. He's earned it in our good times. And dare I say, he's earned it for our bad times as well. And it's in the bad times that his light will shine the brightest in our lives. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's a promise. And he always keeps his promises. Listen, if you've never done that, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, maybe you're wondering what all this Jesus stuff is about. Well, it's about knowing and trusting a real person. See, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with the one who's in charge. It's not about rules. It's about a person, Jesus Christ, who loves you so much he came into the world to give his life to rescue you, but is knowable even today. And if you'd like to know him, you need only reach out to him in faith and ask. We'd love to help you do that. So as we finish, how do we cope with the hard times? Well, we cope by relying on and praising the one from whom all of life's hardships flee in terror, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you trust him? Because he can help. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you're master of every circumstance. You're the one who's in charge. Help us to be brave and bold about trusting you in private, but also in public, about all of the challenges we face in life. You're good for it, Lord. You keep your promises. Help us to trust them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know how well you know the story of Job, but it's one of the most challenging tales in the Bible. Job was a wealthy, prosperous and faithful man whom God allowed Satan to test with suffering. And there's a moment very early on in the story, after Job has lost everything, his life is falling apart, where he takes time to choose to praise God. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And our next song picks up that theme, inviting us to choose to bless the name of the Lord, whether in hard times or in good times. 
So let's stand for this and offer our hearts to the Lord. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Well, do take a seat. Now, we often hear in the media about the growth of Islam in the UK. Uh, one thing the media doesn't talk about so much is the number of Christians who have come to faith from Islam. And I thought it'd be great to hear from one of them this morning. This is Nabil Qureshi. He's a Muslim medical student who recently became a Christian. I believed Islam was genuinely true. I believed that it was the true monotheism, that Christians who worship the Trinity were polytheists. Mm. Uh, not realizing it, uh, they, they didn't realize that they were worshiping three. Uh, they would say one, but it was actually three, and they didn't know what they were doing. That's what I believed. And so I would extend people the invitation to Islam. I would argue 
that the Bible isn't reliable. I would argue mm. that Jesus' death on the cross doesn't pay for one's sins, mm. uh, that Jesus never claimed to be God. These kinds of basic Islamic claims, I would argue for them, and what I found was that the average Christian had no response. Mm. And so that made me more confident and bold in presenting Islam to Christians. So it wasn't until I got to my university that I ran into somebody who actually had a response. And okay. In his case, it was defending the Bible. He gave me good reasons to believe the Bible was reliable. So this person was obviously very influential. You had, I think, a number of long-running discussions and debates with him. Uh, you were roommates, is that correct? Well, we met uh, because we were both on the debate team, um, and we were on a tournament together, and we ended up uh, rooming together on those tournaments. Yeah. Um, but after that, I found out he was studying biology. I was doing pre-med, and so we would sign up for classes together. We would study <laughs> together, and in our free time, we would just argue about, uh, right. about the Quran and about the Bible. and. Uh, so, yeah, we really did have great long discussions, which lasted over the course of years. I mean, he didn't convince me of anything overnight. It was no. the fact that we had this long-running discussion where we could revisit things that we had discussed before. What would you say was the turning point for you then? The turning point, I would say, was, uh, well, first, we didn't talk about Islam critically right away. The, the, we talked critically about Christianity, and I was quite convinced that the Bible had been altered over time that Jesus never claimed to be God, that the Trinity was unreliable in terms of uh, unviable as a concept even. Mm. Um, and so over the course of these discussions, he was able to show me how he could rely upon the text of mm. the Scripture, um, how we could know that the New Testament message has not been changed. Um, and it took me about a year, but I realized that's probably true. But then I asked, where in the Bible does Jesus claim to be God? Now, that's kind of the most important thing mm. for Muslims, mm. um, because Jesus is a prophet, according to Muslims. He's the Messiah, even, but he's not God. And according to the Quran, he never claimed to be God. Uh, so if we find that the New Testament is reliable, and therein he claims to be God, that's a problem for Muslims. Mm. So first, looking at the Gospel of John, and then moving my way through the synoptics to Mark's Gospel, uh, I realized that Jesus always claimed to be God, all four Gospels. He's God, even before the Gospels were written, if you believe Paul's mm -hmm. writings came first, which most people do. Paul says Jesus is God. The early Christian community uniformly said Jesus is God. And how are these Jews who are so emphatically monotheist saying mm -hmm. this man is God? Uh, it only makes sense if we conclude that Jesus himself claimed to be God. And so when I realized that the historical evidence was in favor of Christianity, that's what got me to bend my knee to God and say, God, can you show me who you are? It wasn't that I was convinced Christianity was true, mm. but that's when the search went from an academic one to a heartfelt one. Tune in to The Profile Interview in association with Christianity Magazine every Saturday at 4 p.m. Only on Premier Christian Radio, where faith comes to life. Well, I hope that inspired and encouraged you to pray with me now and to carry on praying later. Let's bow our heads and bring God into our nation's situation. Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation. We ask your blessing upon our Prime Minister and all who lead us. May they act with integrity and with wisdom. Guide them into the ways of truth. Particularly give them wisdom about unlocking things to do with foreign travel and guide them about how to handle the tensions over the border with Ireland and the border checks upon the North Sea. We pray for your church, Lord. We pray for church leaders everywhere particularly. Give them courage and wisdom as they continue to try to respond to these strange times. We pray for the growth of the gospel. Help us to reach out in mission. We pray particularly for our congregations. They would grow in discipleship. Lord, I'm minded from that, that testimony story earlier of how the Christian that Nabil got to know was able to defend the integrity of the Bible to him. Lord, I thank you for raising up people like that. And I pray that we would all learn more about what a good and reliable historical document your word is and that is therefore trustworthy. Lord, we pray for those known to us who are unwell at this time. Let's just have a moment of quiet. You might want to name somebody before the Lord who, who just needs a special touch of healing at this time. And remember also all those who are grieving, Lord. Grant them your peace. May they not be overwhelmed by their circumstances, but have the courage to trust you despite all that's going on. And we pray a special blessing upon all our wedding couples this week too, Lord that you'd be with them. Particularly we pray for Matt and Rhiannon on Monday, 
that it would be a joyous Christian wedding and that your name would be honoured above all else. Thank you, Lord, that you listen to our prayers. Bless us all now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to draw our prayers together now by praying the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, we're going to finish our time together with a classic song, all about Jesus' rule and authority over the whole universe. I said before, we know the chap in charge, don't we? Well, why don't we stand and sing along with this great song that's all about the chap in charge? Who's the king of the jungle? <laughs> King of the jungle, who, who, who's the king of the sea? Bubble, 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 who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? I'll tell you, J E S U S. Yes, he's the king of me. He's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. Come on. Who's the king of the jungle? Who, who, who's the king of the sea? Bubble, 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 who's the king of the universe? And who's the King of me, I'll tell you. J E S U S. Yes, he's the king of me. He's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. fun worshipping with you today. I hope this time has been an encouragement to you. Do invite others to join us online worshipping week by week and also come along in person to Breakfast Church on July the 3rd in Upton and on subsequent weeks as well. If this is your first time worshipping with us, welcome. I hope you've enjoyed it and if there's any way we can help you in your spiritual journey during these unusual times, please get in touch on Facebook or send us an email at barry at hopechurchfamily.org. Just visit our website as well, hopechurchfamily.org. You can subscribe to our newsletter there. Shall I finish with a prayer? May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Bye-bye.